Okay, ladies and germs. Yes, uh, handy young with words when you need them, huh? Um, Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a service of the members of the Public Affairs Forum. We offer um, public spirited um, issues and debate in an open public forum. Uh, the only limitation is you have to be a member of the forum to ask questions of the individuals. We're going to have a uh, discussion on the uh, PERS with um, local economists and um, Nate Fields and Mark Abrams, an employee of the Department of Justice, and I believe the um, bargaining leader down, it, it, down in Salem. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But the first thing we do is a little internal business. We have a poll, a forum location poll. See this little sheet of paper right there? That, 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 that has um, all kinds of um, um, importance as to the future of the forum, where we're located, things of that nature. We just want to get the, the sense of the body as to where, there are, where our location should go. As everyone's aware, the PERS is an issue of interest today. Um, and I just saw last uh, night a uh, presentation Mark Abrams did on television. And this is a TV show also. This is 58 minutes of TV. And it's 15 and 15 with questions. So I expect the questions to be very um, succinct. What would we say? One question, you go back the line, you can follow up in your turn. Um, the business meeting is next week. Let's all be there. We're going to adopt some new bylaws with modifications. There's been some certain concerns about certain portions, and I think the board's responding to those. So the most important meeting of the year is the one where we organize and adopt the new bylaws, which have not been tweaked for some time and are actually not in conformance with statute. So have we decided which one goes first? I think Nate Fields, a local economist, will probably want to finish chewing his soup a little bit. So I'll let Mark go first. Um, Mark Abrams is a, is a lawyer he, with the Department of Justice. He has a radio show. He's a very uh, well-known local activist. I've known him for a number of years. I could go into greater depth, but um, shame and decency probably restrict me. <laughs> thank you, everyone, and, and thank you for inviting us here to have this discussion. There's been very little of this going on this year. Uh, you know, what I, I do is I wake up every Sunday morning and I take my blood pressure medication before I read the latest story, if you could call it that, from Ted Sickinger in the Oregonian. So I think that if that's the source you've been getting most of your information about the PERS issue from, uh, I'm, I'm here, and I hopefully, I think Eric Cruz is also here to, 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 to give you more and, and better information today. And I think Eric and I may disagree on some things, but mostly I think we're going to talk about some of these issues that are problematic. I don't have necessarily an answer proposed to you, but I do suggest the problem is a little different from how the Oregonian's been going on. And frankly, it, it's gotten to the point where I've been comparing it to William Randolph Hearst trying to start the Spanish-American War that been pounding on it so much. As, as John said, my name is Mark Abrams. Uh, in full disclosure, I am a public employee. Is anybody here a public employee or public employee retiree? Okay, when we're done, you guys flying away, just get me out of here safely. Um, I am a, an attorney, a senior assistant attorney general in the, in the Department of Justice for the state of Oregon. I serve all of you. My job is to save you money as taxpayers because I defend employment and constitutional lawsuits. I am also president of Local 1085 VASME, which represents the lawyers in the Department of Justice. Yes, I am the president of a union of lawyers. If that's not a scary thought, I don't know what is. And then finally, I am, I am the recently elected treasurer of AFSCME Council 75, representing over 24,000 public employees, both state and local. Um, so I guess I am the, the, the best-made union goon today. Um, well, you got one here, too. Yeah, that's right. Nellie, Nellie's here. So she, she's got way better pedigree on this than I do. I, you know, because I did spend 24 years in the private sector before joining state government. I am not a, a career public employee. You've all been hearing about how PERS is unsustainable. Of course, you've also been hearing about how Medicare is unsustainable, Medicaid is unsustainable, Social Security is unsustainable. And the answer from most of the people telling you it's unsustainable is screw the recipient. You know, that, that seems to be the simplest answer. I, I, since I'm a lawyer, I keep contracts along. One of the, one of the hypotheticals you get, it's funny because my kid and I were re-watching Paper Chase this weekend and all things. A photographic memories of no use in the practice of law. You know, uh, and it took me back and not in a pleasant way. But the hypothetical.
hypothetical I remember from contracts is none of the ones they go over in paper chips, and I don't think any of the cases they used were real. But I want you to imagine you're a painter. And you're, up on, you're up on a ladder. I've contracted with you. I'm the house owner. I've, I've offered to give you 5,000 bucks to paint your house, my house. You're 75% of the way through. You're teetering up there on the ladder. You're reaching for, for a little bit of the trim. And I yell up, you know something? I've changed my mind. I'm only paying you 2,500 bucks. That's what's going on here. In the simplest sense, I want you to understand that what we are calling PERS reform has nothing to do with reform. We're not talking about corruption. We're not talking about ineptitude. We're talking about compensation reduction, plain and simple. Now, you may like that, and there may be some people here who are all for it. But let's be honest. The word reform is disingenuous and misapplied. Public employees have worked now and yesterday and for years and years in the past in exchange for a series of compensation promises that they understood at the time and to which they are entitled from you and from me. I'm also a taxpayer because they've already completed that performance. And when you have an annuity with a set of terms, you can't say, well, they've got seven more years to go. They've worked 22, 23 years already. You can't change those terms. That's why when the legislature has twice before undertaken to cut the cost of PERS, they created in 1996 Tier 2, and in 2003 what they dared not call Tier 3, so they called it OPSERP. It's Tier 3. I call it Tier 3. Everybody in government calls it Tier 3. And each time they lessened what you could get. They raised the age of retirement. 55 to 58, from 58 to 60. They lowered the benefits between Tier 2 and OPSER from 1.66% per year times your three highest years average salary, which is the baseline formula, to 1.5. Now, what you need to understand is PERS historically was designed to guarantee, in conjunction with Social Security, 75% of your final income to someone who works 30 years. And Social Security, roughly speaking, is 25%, and PERS was 50%. OPSERP, even if you do it for 30 years, is now 45%. So you may be asking, what about all those people retiring at 120% of their salary, the martinis on the front page of the Oregonian in front of their pool in Arizona? What about Mike Bellotti? Yeah, yeah the average PERS retiree is Mike Bellotti, uh, who, by the way, got PERS applied to non-state funded money. And if somebody can explain that one to me, he became the poster child. You know, him. Uh, the, the neuroscientists at OHSU and Steve Goldschmidt, uh, the former governor's brother, are like the ten top recipients. Um, you might be surprised to know that over the last 15 or so years, 7% of the people have retired over 100% of their salary. And a lot of that has to do with how things get rolled in, sick leave, vacation, spiking. And I'm not here to defend spiking. I think spiking is reasonably indefensible, rolling in your last year overtime. Um, I'm not against all reforms. I think that one would be a, would be a fairly good one. Um, the average PERS retiree, anyone, anyone now, take, take a guess. What is the average PERS retiree getting annually? Anyone know? $25,000. You're pretty close. Yeah, it's 20, 26, 27,000 bucks a year, which means their Social Security is about 13 a year, which means they're retiring on 40 a year plus what they've managed to save. This is not a wealthy person. This is a hardworking person who gave you 25 or 30 years of their life. So the bottom line is what this whole effort is about this year, and, and I blame the Democratic governor as well as the Republican members of the legislature. On the other hand, I, I want to have Tina Kotek's baby. I love her. Um, <laughs> is but they, they've just decided they don't want to pay what they fairly contracted to pay so they can buy something else. And I admit, you know, as Eric knows, I spent 12 years on boards of education. I spent a term on the Multnomah ESD board. I was chair of that board. I spent two terms on the Portland School Board. I spent more than half that time as vice chair of the board. And more importantly, six of my eight years, I was the budget chair of that board. I know school districts have a problem. I know that when PERS rises to more than a quarter of your overall compensation costs, it's a problem. But that's what the first two reforms were, were due to. You've got to allow 
the rodent the snake has eaten to work its way through the snake, you know? And, and that's tier one. What you need to understand is the legislature is trying to hire more teachers for you this year at the expense of the existing teachers because they're whose benefits would be cut to make up for those more teachers. The legislature ignores, and Eric and I were talking about this a little before we, we, we got, I got up here, that, that there are certain people out there who think, okay, we'll just cut them, we'll cut them, we'll cut them, and nothing will happen. What makes you think a government worker isn't as big a capitalist as someone in the private sector? What makes you think you make it too crappy to work in government? Most of them won't work. What, you do, what people don't understand is that state government is a very white-collar group. Soil scientists, lawyers, doctors, dentists, psychiatrists, social workers, a very large percentage of our people, not only, almost everybody has bachelor's degrees, you know, outside of places like DOT, many, many, many have graduate degrees. It's a very high percentage. I know Multnomah County, it's like more than half of the workforce in Multnomah County, and I assume Washington County the same way, have graduate degrees. They are movable, and if you make life that crappy, they will move. We've been losing young lawyers for years. They come out saddled 150,000 in debt. We pay them 62,000 a year. We train them, we make, give them their first few trials, and then Stoll Reeves or Tom Kintor comes along and says, hey, 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 130, 130 grand, and they go. So you're, you're tax pay, you as taxpayers are paying for the training of lawyers who then turn around and sue the state because we can't pay them enough to keep them. There's, there's an irony. And teachers will leave for Vancouver. The other issue is that anybody who sees this coming, and believe me, if you don't think we're all looking, and can jump, will jump. And so your tier one costs in the short run may go up probably quite a bit. And that's an unanticipated consequence. So putting aside Mike Bellotti, talking about that 26, 27 year retiree, my suggestion to you is yes, the school district had a problem, and no, I don't have an answer for it for you today, because I don't think the answer being proposed is a fair one, but I'm not, I haven't been the number cruncher saying here's the alternative to what we do. But let me suggest to you why we have already mostly solved the problem. I don't know how many of you read the City Club report out of Portland last year, which I think criminally did not disaggregate Tier 1 and Tier 2 in its lumping of, of the costs. Tier 2, ladies and gentlemen, is 96% self-funded. OPSERP is 100% funded. The problem has largely been solved since 1996. What we're dealing with is the cost of what we racked up prior to that time. If you look at where the debt is, 68% of it is to existing retirees and 24% to tier one. In other words, only 8% of all those liabilities you've heard about are tier two and officer, the people who've joined government in the last 17 years. And, and forgive me if I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you, but tier one is rapidly phasing out. Tier one is about 25% of local government workers now, only 17% of the state, because we tend to have more rapid turnover. We don't have teachers who stay in one place for 30 years as much. The problem is somewhat getting solved. And you know, the short-term issues should not obscure the hard choices the state has already made. And I'm sure you've all, wait, you've all heard that PERS has an $18 billion liability. Well, in 2007, do you know what its liability was? Zero. Nothing, not a zilch. What happened was what happened to everything else in the economy. Now, the economy is rapidly improving. The market is rapidly improving. The investment rate has gotten a lot better. PERS, and they publish a wonderful thing. You can go online to Oregon.gov and click on PERS and then click on PERS at a glance. And each month they update this. It's called PERS by the Numbers. This will make anyone but a hardcore math nerd glaze over, but it's really great stuff. The debt right now, according to PERS, is $13 billion. And then if you count the side accounts that were created, and you should count the side accounts, it's $8.5 billion and it continues to decline. So when you hear about how Medicare is going broke in 2016, no, 2028, now only 2024, this is the same kind of thing. Because this liability, let's remember, it's not due now. It's not ever due at one moment. 
This is a cumulative calculation, I believe, of the revenue stream of all liability to all workers currently in PERS. And I presume only those who are vested. I assume they're not counting for people in the first five years of service. So that includes, hypothetically, someone who got out of high school in 2008, joined your local government, and is just vested at age 23, and even under OPSERC, must work 35 more years, or wait 35 more years, in order to get their pension. What are the odds that person's going to do that? What are the odds we know how much they'll be paid? What are the odds we know what our investments are going to yield in the next 35 years? Which is not to say there's no number, but it's to say the number is to a large extent the kind of number economists and actuaries are comfortable with, but we should only be comfortable with it in a much broader sense that we know we've got a debt, but it is payable well into the lifetimes of everyone in this room. It is not a, oh my God, can somebody please get the checkbook out and write 13 billion right now. Now, the people who would be reformed out of some of their retirement, by the way, I think there are some of you in the room. I, let me tell you, I, I, I looked for Washington County last night as I was going through this stuff. 9,900 PERS retirees live in this county. Their contribution to your economy is $274 million a year. Quarter of a billion, more than a quarter of a billion bucks, these retirees are pumping into your economy. So I don't deny there's a cost here, but there are benefits as well. There are benefits from a program fairly bargained, fairly worked for, and the price of the services you've always already largely received. What we have is the phasing out of tier one, the baby boom bubble, of which I am at the tail end. I'm, don't worry, I'm not gonna be a cost to you for at least another decade. Um, so I would just suggest that to some extent what's being called PERS reform is a false promise. And more importantly, it is a promise. There are some things that, that can be worked on, and, and Eric may address some of those issues about actuarial tables, issues about interest rates, although to me that one sounds a lot like the chain CPI debate going on in DC right now. Let's make seniors a little more hungry and a little more hungry and a little more hungry until they're 85 and then they're really friggin' hungry. So, I raised to you the moral question. You all, y'all, I grew up in Manhattan, but I love y'all. <laughs> we all, acting as citizens, electing government, who bargained in good faith at a bargaining table under the rules of the Public Employee Collective Bargaining Act, we made a deal. We got the work. And now we're saying, hey, <laughs> fooled you. Who goes to work for people like that? And more importantly, who are people like that? I hope it's not too many people in this room. I hope you understand there is a moral obligation in every contract. We learned that in first year of law school. A contract is about moral obligations between two parties fairly entering into a good faith relationship. So I would say not only shouldn't most of the things being called PERS reform occur, you shouldn't even try. So with that, I will, I will yield to Eric. There's, there's issues about PERS pickup. There's issues about Senate Bill 822. Maybe if there's interest, we can address those during the questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm an economist with uh, Nathan Associates, uh, an economic consulting firm. Uh, I'm based out of Portland now. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at Portland State University, which means uh, adjuncts is another word of saying part-timer. Uh, and uh, you know, one thing about that is I actually do pay dues to the American Federation of Teachers, although they've made it very clear I'm not a member of their union. I just have to pay them to uh, act on my behalf. Uh, I am also a member of Tier 3 at PERS, uh, OSPER, which sounds like something you do if you have too much to drink. Um, but, uh, and I, I've been, full disclosure, I am a member of Tier 3, and uh, I have a total of, I think, uh, $700 in my account, which would not even pay my mortgage for one month. Uh, so I don't think uh, I'm coming from a, you know, a, 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 an entrenched position here. Uh, I have done some work in the past involving PERS, uh, back when the first set of reforms came through in 2003, 2004. 
Those went straight to the Oregon Supreme Court. I uh, testified on behalf of the employers, employers meaning uh, state and local governments that, that, um, that hire, that have the retirees uh, to, uh, to argue the economics of some of the reforms. Uh, I would say roughly about half of those forms survived the court challenge, uh, the other half got thrown out. Uh, and so here we are today uh, with the legislature debating whether or not we should have more uh, reforms. I know that uh, Mr. Abrams would like to put the word reforms in quote marks, um, but uh, we'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Just backing up a little bit, and as you know, uh, PER stands for the Public Employee Retirement System. And, and PERS is not really uh, that unusual in, in many respects from other state pension schemes. It, it, we talk over and over about uh, pension reforms as kicking the can down the road. And to me, I've always thought that's kind of funny because the whole idea of a defined benefit system is to kick the can down the road. Uh, Mark gave this great example of the, the guy up on the ladder um, doing the painting. And you say, OK, I'm going to pay, what was it, $200? You get $200 to paint the house. Uh, well, the way that these pension systems work are they say, yeah, we'll pay you $200 to paint the house now, but my kids are going to pay you another $200 20 years from now. And that's one of the problems that we really have with these pension systems and these promises. And, and I won't deny that those were promises. Those were, were promises that were made, but they were promises that don't really reflect the nature of our economy, that there's ups and downs, and that sometimes there's promises that you can't make. Uh, years and years ago when I was a kid, like 10 years old, uh, my dad said, tell you what, you take, I'll take care of you for your first 20 years and you take care of me for my last 20. Well, guess what, my friends, I can't take care of my dad in his last 20 because I can barely take care of myself. You know, that's a promise that I can't keep. And that's one of the problems you have with these pension schemes is that these were really generous promises that were made at the time because they, they I guess it's, it's comforting that, that our people before us had a lot of confidence in us that we could overcome all the bold promises that they made on our behalf. But the bottom line is, is we've gotten to the point now where we can't. They're unsustainable promises. They were pie in the sky promises that were made that really can't, that are unsustainable. We love the word sustainable. Well, these were unsustainable promises. Um, if you look at the rates that employers pay. So if you think about uh, remember, employers in this case we're talking about are things like school districts, uh, city governments, the state government. Those are the employers. Their employer rate has doubled. The amount that they have to pay into the system has doubled as a percent of total compensation over the past 10 years. Double. That's phenomenal. That's a huge increase. And so you have these huge unsustainable increases. And Mark's correct that uh, that you can think of PERS as kind of a, a snake swallowing a rat, although I think it's not really a rat, it's more like a, like a, a pig because it's a, it's a lot bigger uh, than we think. It's a, big, it's a big snake and a big pig uh, that's trying to get swallowed. Um, and, um, and he's right, you know, this problem will solve itself, but man, oh man, it's going to be a rough 20 or 30 years. Because all, he's correct, you know, that we do have, you know, roughly, you know, say 20% of the total public employee workforce that are in tier one, but if you also look out there, we still have a sizable number of tier one people who are still in their 30s or 40s. And those people are, some could be 18, 20 years away from retirement. That's a big problem that we're gonna have to deal with for a long period of time. My kids are going to be my age when the tiers one problem is solved. I, I worked with a guy once who used to joke that, you know, the, the only real way to solve the, peer, the, tier, the, the tier one problem is that we should start sending out a carton of cigarettes with every uh, verse check. You don't like that. Uh -huh. Because really that's the only way that, that the problem is going to be solved. And, and Mark is right that we have, and I know that my Republican friends don't like to hear this, uh, but a lot of times a lot of people don't like to hear the truth. And the truth is, is that for those tiers one, tier one people, We've been there, done that. I think we have tried to squeeze as many reforms out of tier one as possible that uh, Governor Kulongoski and the legislature at the time had some pretty bold changes. Only about half of them survived uh, the, the state Supreme Court. And there's really not much more that can be done. And remember, you also, so you've got the legal issues with the contracts, but you also have a political issue. One of the political issues you have is you gotta remember that every single person along the way of deciding PERS reforms is collecting PERS. 
all the way from the legislator to the staff to the courts who are actually deciding on the legislation are all members of hers. And so I'm not saying that they're, um, that they're dishonest, but they have a certain degree of self-interest in maintaining uh, the system as it is. So with that said, I mean, there are some, some reforms out there that have been uh, suggested. Uh, one is getting rid of the 6% the pickup. Um, and uh, Mark and I talked about this earlier, and I can, we can talk about the details in the Q&A session. But uh, one of the most common uh, refrains is that we should eliminate the 6% pickup. And what we mean by the pickup is that there's a portion of the, the premiums that are paid <clears throat> into the PERS system that are supposed to be paid by the employee. And that's 6% of the total cost. Uh, several years ago, probably closer to, what, 20 years ago now, about 20 years ago, the um, uh, instead of giving employees raises, the employers decided to pick up that extra 6%. Again, it's another way of kicking the can down the road because they said, okay, now, instead of paying you an extra 6% a year, uh, we're going to essentially credit your account with an additional 6%. We're going to pay for that forever and ever and ever, you know, essentially on until, you know, until infinity, just to pay for a pay raise uh, back in 1989. Uh, so some would argue that that 6% pickup uh, should be eliminated. There's some, there's some other tax consequences to that, federal tax consequences, which would probably uh, reduce in, in a substantial way the benefits of trying to eliminate that 6% pickup. Uh, so that may actually be a wash. Probably the big thing, you, you're not only going to start hearing about this now, is what's known as the crediting rate. And uh, the, the PERS board had a meeting on Friday, and um, of course they didn't come to a decision. They came to a decision to decide uh, in the future, and they're dropping some pretty strong hints that they are going to change the crediting rate. And I should back up here and explain what's meant by the crediting rate. What happens is, you know, I've, I've got a 401k and it earns a certain amount per year. Some years it does really well, some years it doesn't do well at all, some years it does horrible. <clears throat> but, you know, on average I'm expecting some sort of positive return. And if you look at the public employee retirement system, uh, their money is handled by what's known as the Oregon Investment Council and they make investments and sometimes they have good years, sometimes they have bad years. And on average over time, they've averaged about 8% a year uh, returns. And so what happens then is under the PERS system, you say, well, if you are assuming that we earn 8% returns a year, then we will credit to people's accounts 8% a year. Now, one of the problems that you have with that is, of course, the, the stock market bounces all over the place. And so if times are doing really well, um, you could get 8%. In the old days, you could get even more than 8%, but that's been changed. But now you get the 8%. But if times are really bad, you get 8%. And so uh, you can have years of, of bad stock returns, and you're still trying to get to then pay out of your pocket to pay for those additional returns. It's almost like breaking out the credit card to, to fund your 401k. That's probably not the best use of money. And so what's happened now over time is we've, there's been a discussion about, is 8% the right amount? And it's a huge fight, uh, and it's based on, really, depending on when you start looking at it and when you end looking at it. 8% may be right. Some are saying it's closer to 7.5%. The rumors I've heard are that, that the first board will probably go to a 7.5% crediting rate. That's down from 8. Uh, and that they will probably phase it in over the next couple of years. Again, when you hear the word phase in, you can also hear the can kind of skittering down the road because the PERS loves to phase things in. And when we phase things in, we're kicking the can down the road. In other words, we don't want to face the pain right now. Um, so you're going to see that coming up. And you're going to, I guarantee, I'm sure uh, Mr. Abrams will be able to tell us whether or not there's going to be a huge fight about that because that will come, that will affect retirees' accounts. It will also affect employer rates. And this is where you will have the employers and the employees really butting heads. Um, <clears throat> another issue is what is known as side accounts. And Mr. Abrams mentioned that um, briefly. What happened was, was after the first recession, in the wake of the, the first set of reforms, there was a huge, what's known as an unfunded actuarial liability, a UAL. Terrible name. All it means is, let's pretend that we had to liquidate the first system today. If we had to liquidate it, and we had to pay off everyone who's in the system now, 
and we have the money that's sitting in here now, you know, do we have enough to pay all those people? If you don't have enough, that's the liability. And there was a pretty big liability at the time. I think it was close to $17 billion in the early 2000s, around 2003, 2004. And so these employers were going to get huge increases in their employer rates. The other thing that was happening at that time was we had relatively low bond rates. They're even lower now, but they were, we thought that they were the lowest they were ever going to be back then. We had very low bond rates. And uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I advised the Oregon School Boards Association on the pluses and minuses of these side accounts. And the idea was what you do is you go off into the bond market, you, you issue a bunch of bonds at the relatively low rate, you put them into your, um, your Oregon Investment Council account or the PERS account, and hopefully it will earn 8%. So it's a kind of an arbitrage game, right? You're gonna be paying roughly 4% and you're hoping to earn about 8%. Things were great. They were doing fantastic for the first few years. And it was just phenomenal because everyone was looking like a genius. And then if you go back and look at the news stories back from about 2008 or 2009, they'll be like, oh my gosh, what did these idiots do? They, they whipped out the credit card and funded the pension fund and they lost all the money. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, like the, it's almost like a Lucille Ball show type of thing. You know, you lost the money, Lucy. Um, it, it's now, it's since come back. You know, I've always said that if I could live my life all over again, I would have taken every single dime I had and put it in the stock market on the day that Barack Obama was inaugurated because the stock market has just gone gangbusters since then. And that's what's happening now. And, and Perders is banking on that. They're banking on, on huge investment returns saving us. And I was warned a long time ago in, in graduate school by a professor when we were studying the savings and loan industry. He said, anytime you hear someone say, well, we can grow our way out of it, you should run and hide your wallet. I, I, my guess is that every single guy who ran a Ponzi scheme did not start off trying to run a Ponzi scheme, but really started off saying, I could grow our way out of this problem. And so that's one of the things we need to really worry about. What we have are these huge side accounts. And even the this, this Senate Bill 822, which doesn't, which doesn't really... Um, issue bonds it essentially is making us borrow more money in order to pay for that. We're making a bet. It could be a big bet on whether or not the stock market is going to keep going. And that's a huge bet because one of the things that's driving the stock market right now is this thing known as quantitative easing. We're on, I think it's QE3. Some people call it QE infinity because it seems like it's going to go on and on and on. But we're thinking, you know, kind of, I hate to say the word consensus when we're talking about economists because there isn't one. Uh, but the quote-unquote consensus is that quantitative easing is going to end around 2014, 2015. When that happens, you're going to see probably a, a decline in the housing market. You're probably going to see slower growth, if not a decline, in the stock market. The stock market's being driven a lot by this quantitative e easing because it's injected a lot of money into the system, and it's also made the alternative investments less uh, interesting, less lucrative, and so people are putting money into stocks. When that game's over, you're going to see the you're going to see a small pop, uh, and it may be a big bubble or a little bubble. We don't know. I have no idea. But that's something we need to worry about. Is that in the next few years there's going to be a huge amount? I would say risk, a huge amount of risk in the capital markets. And so I, you know, I don't think it's particularly wise to uh, right now to be betting on ever increasing investment returns. So, so uh, you know, I like to think of myself as kind of a conservative investor. I would think that this crediting of reducing the crediting to seven and a half is probably wise because uh, I think it reflects the, the, the potential risk out there of the stock market not performing as well as it has been. Um, so just kind of wrapping up here, uh, remember that, that PERS is really not different at all from most other public pension systems in that it is designed to kick the can down the road. And you know, there's a huge problem with that. And one of the problems that you have, and has nothing to do with economics, it has nothing to do with contractual rights, has everything to do with the issue that you know, today, my kid's classroom has a lot more kids in it because some other classroom 20 years before could have, a, could have fewer kids in it. And so we have kids today paying the price for the decisions that were made in the past and similarly, any sort of long-run decisions we make on pension reform now are benefits and costs that we're going to layer on the, the next generations. 
And with that, I think we should probably open it up to Q&A. Sure. Okay, questions are asked from the forum members. It's, while people are getting up to the questioning, it's kind of interesting. This um, whole um, year I've had here has been one of talking about limits, infrastructure, people predicting bridges falling down and, and, uh, and, and piping systems for sewage, things like that, becoming obsolete. The education folks coming in here talking about limits on funding, etc. And the first thing talking about uh, public funding limitations. It's kind of interesting. The forum itself has been talking about what limits it has with regard to um, its outreach efforts. And we we're also talking about the Pepper Mill uh, which is in a low between 170 and 185th as a venue. Um, the spaghetti factory needs a certain volume of meals. And, uh, during the political season, we hit it every year. We hit it very well. The off-year systems, we don't hit the, um, the, the meal mark as much as, as we'd like to. So I think there's 35, uh, maybe possibly 40 folks here. But um, that's one of the limits the forum has reached. So this is a term of limits. And I'm going to let you ask one question, not a limitless question, to either of these two folks. Why don't you come up here and sit up here? Uh, you guys are both very sophisticated. I think you can handle a give and take, so you won't see me until I'm flagging you down in about 15 minutes. Are you good with that? And the podium will hide our elbows, right? Yeah, yeah exactly, right. exactly. My name is uh, Bill Kroger. I'm a forum member. Thank you for coming. Enjoyed your presentations. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> the uh, Social Security system is, is funded by people working today for the people that have retired before them. And basically, that's the same concept for the state system. But you talk a lot about investing money in the stock market and stuff. Social Security, to my knowledge, doesn't do that. So what would happen if, the, if this investment in the state system wasn't done? Would the, would the amount of money that current workers have to pay become astronomical or tell them, you know, that kind of thing? Well, if I recall, and it's in that first facts by the numbers, if I recall correctly from what I read earlier, uh, Approximately 70 to 75 percent of the income that the PERS, the money that flows into PERS uh, in, a, in any given year is from investment returns. And so the other chunk is the 6 percent is paid by the employees and then the rest is paid by the employers. So it, it's, most of it is driven by investment returns. And then at the end, based on some complicated formulas, particularly for Tier 1, um, there may be some more money that needs to be put in that have nothing to do with the returns that the system is. Probably would, but it's an entirely different system. Right. Thank you. I'm Barbara Wilson, a member of the forum. My question is primarily to Mark. Um, every day, every day, without exception, the Oregonian is running either an editorial or a front page article bashing PERS and making it sound like retirees are living high on a hog. What can be done about this? If it were truthful information, I would say, OK. But it's not truthful. What can be done with, with this newspaper? Well, there's a small item called the First Amendment. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and by the way, I, I have a master's in journalism buried in my career. I worked uh, briefly both at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the New York Times. So I'm believer in the free press, um, but with freedom comes responsibility, and I think the Oregonian is a deeply irresponsible paper. They have hired Ted Sickinger for the sole purpose of gaining an outcome. His stories have been biased. For example, he compared Oregon's pension costs a couple months back to Washington, Montana, and Idaho. Does anyone here think we have the same cost of living as Montana and Idaho? Uh, and notably, he did not compare them to California, which, by the way, pays a rate 50% higher. But, gee, they just border us, so what do they know? Um, I actually published a, a, what I hoped would be the beginning of a conversation with him on Blue Oregon several months back. So if you go to Blue Oregon and click on a link for my name, it's the last thing I posted. I don't post a lot because I think blogging has devolved into vicious name calling and psychotics with nothing else to do. You can't get a date trying to get back at you. Um, but but I, I let him know what was going up and invited him to, to respond. And he did not respond with a single fact. He just threw a polemic at me like an average blogger saying, everyone's entitled to their own opinions. Nobody's entitled to their own facts. So which fact did I get wrong, Mr. Sickinger? He, he, 
inclined to respond. Um, you know, and I think I think Eric and I have been in, in, in total agreement on where where the where the numbers are and where the issues are here. The, the, the question is priorities, and and to me, you know, you don't start buying more stuff until you pay for what you got. Because I, I'm, I'm, you know, a lot of people in this room know me. I'm not exactly a conservative. But my dad's a CPA, my grandfather was a CPA, I learned to live within a budget, and I still think liberalism requires responsible application of our principles. And, and so, to me, the Oregonian is saying, you know, let's, let's screw the existing public workforce so that we can hire more teachers. And I agree. There were more kids in my kids' class than, than the generation before. It's not her. Her's, Betsy Hammond had a great article, and, and this is the good side of the Oregonian, because she's a great reporter. Only 25% of the increased costs in Hillsborough, Beaverton, and Portland are hers. The other 75%, which they never say what it is or how they can deal with it, is something else. How about we go back and look at measures 5, 47, and 50? That's the generation-long problem in this community. But I think that just to reiterate, that Betsy Hammond article was was really good, and it you know raises the question that a lot of times I think PERS is is in, is hit upon as being the only problem. That if we solve PERS, we solve all our budget problems. But there's a lot of other problems I think with misplaced priorities that, that really bust, bust the budget. And so um, you know it's, PERS is a problem. It's a big problem, but it's not uh, not the only problem. John William Forum member, and thanks so much for uh, bringing all these uh, information forward. Um, I see the pendulum going back and forth. Um, when it was good, hers didn't, hey, hey, boy, hers was really good. When it goes down, and then all of a sudden it was bad, and then it started to get better again. Well, what about jobs? Um, right now, we have, we have a Congress who is sitting on Benghazi and a bunch of other things, but they're not talking about jobs. Um, they should be working on jobs, developing some kind of a program that we can get our working force out there with our infrastructure and things like that. Would you talk a little bit about that, please? Well, John, and again, this is probably more Eric's thing. One of the things that creates jobs is spending. If you cut people's ability to spend, you are not going to create jobs. And the idea that you have one billionaire and that creates as much as uh, a million thousandaires or whatever the math is, is simply not true because the one billionaire can only buy so many cars you know, you need the middle class, you need the working class spending, and right now when you make it so tight, the middle class and the numbers are there, is hoarding. And so having teachers who can afford to, to replace that car, having social workers who can afford that night out and the babysitter, uh, you know, that's important. And so a healthy economy needs a healthy middle class, including our, 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 our workers in state and local government. I think that you also need to Sort of, sort of look at the bigger picture here about government expenditure because there's a big healthy debate about what's the right level of taxes overall. The second the financial forecast came out a couple of weeks ago, the state house started talking about, okay, let's add several hundred million in teachers, several hundred million in social workers, several hundred million total in, in, in mental health programs. What about if you don't do that? What about if you, you, you give some relief to the taxpayers and just balance your budget and think about, is anything I add now sustainable for 10 or 20 or 30 years, much as it's desirable? What is it government must do and then stop there? And then maybe you'll, you'll, you'll create jobs because you'll have a middle class with a little more in your pocket. Well, I think that, that, I mean, a lot of that was right. I think one of the problems that we have, and the kicker actually solved this problem. I know a lot of people hate the kicker. I, I think the kicker is fantastic because it stops the state from having windfalls. Because when the state has a windfall, what they'll do is they'll start a brand new program. Well, today's brand new program that's a really innovative idea becomes next year's uh, vital service that can't be cut. When we didn't even have that service two years ago. And you know, we see this um, with things like the Healthy Kids Connect program, which has done a miserable job of actually signing up people. That's now considered a vital service that uh, we've now extended hospital taxes on. You know, so I think there's something to be said for having that sort of uh, stability uh, in spending, and I think the kicker helps solve some of that problem. And also, it's again a matter of priorities, and that's the you know what what we decide. That's why we have a legislature to decide what those priorities are. I know there's a lot of people asking questions, so I'll, I won't grandstand. I'm Barbara O'Neill, and I'm a forum member. 
Uh, thank you for your presentations today. Um, I'm interested in your comments about the Senate bill that uh, Governor Kitts Haber signed and uh, limiting the cost of living increases that retirees will get from the PERS. Yeah, one of the things I want to know is, what do you think will happen in court? Uh, me? I'm not a lawyer, and, and I'm terrible at predicting these sorts of things. Uh, but my impression was is that the reason why they did this with the cost of living adjustments is because it was one of the things that, that one of the few things that they thought would survive judicial scrutiny. It, back when the session started, I had this great idea. Uh, Mark would think it's terrible. I was going to call it uh, the Bellotti tax. And the idea... <laughs> Because, yeah, because Bellotti represents, you know, he's, he's a one percenter. I mean, this guy is making $480,000 a year in PERS payments. And you know what he did when he retired? He made a million bucks on ESPN. You know, it, it, to me, that's just out, outrageous. And I don't want to deny anyone's ability to make money or even a lot of money. But, you know, who really needs $480,000 in a public pension to retire? Uh, so I thought, you know, why don't we just have a really onerous 90% tax on anything over $200,000 a year? There's probably about five people in the state who would get that. Well, it turns out that the law said, no, you can't do that. Because if you did that to state employees, you'd have to do it to federal employees. And then you'd have to actually give them some sort of benefit of the bargain. And so I just said, forget it. I threw up my hands and said, I'll let the legislature deal with reforms. Because there's so many things that even great ideas, like a lot of I mean, that's such a great thing. And you can't do it. It's just phenomenal. I'd, go, I'd actually go for that one personally. I, I think this is probably the point at which I know I am here in my own capacity, oh. not representing AFSCME. Um, just got to be careful about this. Was he an AFSCME? Uh, no, no, he was not an AFSCME. I just went, you know, whenever I'm saying, okay, we can take a cut, I probably got to let, let the union disavow any knowledge of my actions. Um, you know, at Senate Bill 22, I, I agree with Eric. It was designed to attack the low hanging fruit, the stuff that was most likely to survive legal scrutiny. There's a very, very bright guy in my department, uh, Keith Covery. He is the head of our tax division. He wrote a series of memos, which I have been sitting on for months thinking, gee, this is all such interesting stuff. And then the Portland Mercury leak, it's announced out in the open. Uh, so somebody did that, not me. I mean, it's, and and uh, he did an evaluation of most through the series of these four memos. Everything you could do to PERS and its constitutionality and likelihood of surviving and virtually everything was <laughs> But the interest rates in the actuarial tables were the most likely to survive scrutiny. And so I, I agree with Eric. That's, that's why they did this. That's why the state house came, to, basically came to the unions and said, you know, guys, you're not gonna like this, but we're gonna hold the line here. Um, and there's a dynamic going on in the legislature, which is uh, the unions are now going back to the House Democratic Caucus is saying, okay, you did that to us, now you have to give us everything else you want. And there's a lot of legislative horse trading going on around that, and I like that personally, but others may not. Uh, I've got a bill I'm trying to pass. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I think that, that 822 is more likely to be constitutional than anything else. I think if we were going to do anything, the other part of 822, the taxing out of staters on their pension, it's like, you move into Arizona, don't come to me and whine about getting special treatment. Spend your money up here. <laughs> I don't want you retiring in Arizona or Florida. Yeah. So, you know, that one I have no problem with at all. Yeah, and there's two parts to it, Mark hit on. There's, there's two things that actually have nothing to do with the legislature and everything to do with the, the PERS, the administration of PERS, the, the, the PERS board. And that is uh, that crediting rate, which I talked about, which is now 8%, which we have hints might go down to seven and a half. And the other are the actuarial tables. And that is if they if they assume that people are going to live longer, then you'll end up getting less money per year because you're because it's spread out over a longer period of time. And there's been there's that's gonna be another area where you're gonna see a lot of discussion. You're gonna see a lot of discussions, you may not see a lot of coverage of it because um, that's something that happens outside the legislature. And so you're gonna have people like the like the unions and the employers making a lot of noise, but you're probably not going to see a lot of uh, energy from the legislators themselves on that. So it's something you're going to have to probably you know, dig through on the, in the newspaper or um, some other site if you don't like the paper. Yeah, there, one, one, one point, Eric made a point when he was talking about you know, everyone being self-interested. Just so, so we're clear, the legislature is in PERS and probably has as, as much in its account as Eric does yes. because they're based on a 20,000 pay. The judges are in a separate PERS. It's called Judge PERS. It, it is 
immune from all this because there's a special constitutional provision to insulate judges from the appearance of favoritism. You cannot reduce their compensation. How nice to be freed from conflicts with that kind of, that kind of mechanism. So whatever the judges do, it will not affect them. So they're free to screw or not screw whoever they want, knowing that it doesn't affect anybody in a black room. Be careful, yeah. be careful with judges. <laughs> Harry Bodine, foreign member who retired from the Oregonian in 1998 and who uh, is very fortunate to have a pension, a private pension, pension which happens to be funded by the way. The, uh, it pays about 30% of my final salary and it has not adjusted one dime since 1998. I'm doing just fine. And it's a lot less than the average 26, 28,000 you're talking about. I'd be delighted to have that. Okay, enough of the, of the sermon. The question, 8%. I, where in the real world can anyone get 8% guaranteed forever? Or maybe even seven and a half in, in the real world. And why do we, I know this, the contracts were drawn. In, in good faith, I'll also point out we've had Democratic governors for 28 years who appointed the PERS boards for a very favorably inclined toward PERS recipients, including PERS recipients. Anyway, seven, what's this guarantee of eight and seven and a half percent when if I go to my bank, you know, uh, I'm not gonna get anywhere within light years of that. Well, and Harry, let me say that if I were, you know, sitting there at the negotiating table with management side some a number of years ago, yeah, it, it sounds pretty crazy. To me, the issue is having bargained, are you obligated to continue doing it? Um, as, as to your pension, you know, part of the problem is in America, back at the end of World War II, people talked about the three-legged stool. It was going to be your savings, your retirement plan, and your Social Security. And you were supposed to combine those three. And the idea that PERS plus Social Security would equal 75% still is predicated on the idea you'd figure out how to save for the other 25% yourself. Now, the private sector has disinvested in the pension business. They've gone broke. They've ended them, and and you know while I, I think that's wrong, I think it is going to hurt America in the long way because private sector is really passing costs back to the public sector, which means just as taxpayers, as more people need to use government services because they can't afford medical care or something else themselves. Uh, so what I would say to you and others in in your circumstance is, I appreciate that you're not getting this deal, but policy should be not made on. Uh, whether or not you know you, people are resentful or jealous, not to say that you are, but there's a lot of that out there in the discourse. It should be based on what's the promise, what's good policy, and good policy is still maintaining the three-legged stool. So I'd say to you, it's less about reforming our pensions and more about taking a look at how America takes care, care of its retirees, public and private sector. Well, I, I'm uh, I'm not a baby boomer in. Um, I'm just at the end of the baby boom, and uh, I have to say, you know, we, we're worse off than, than any baby boomers will ever be as a generation. I think we kind of, I think with, your, with the baby boom generation, we peaked, and, uh, you know, in terms of financial stability, uh, with the change in 401ks, which was necessary, uh, you know, we have now, I think we have got like something like 40% of the people say that they uh, don't think that they're ready at all for retirement my age, you know, that's just phenomenal. Uh, so I think, you know, it, I, I'm terrified. I think that, uh, you know, when I'm 65 or 70 years old, I'm going to have a lot of my, uh, a lot of my colleagues are going to be living in boxes somewhere because, uh, because really, I mean, there, there's just, the, the, the pension systems just are totally different and, that, and all that money seems to have gone away. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, you know, that's one of the big, it, it, I think you just got to get ready for the worst. Kathy Stanton, a former member. Mr. Fuchs, this is for you. Um, my parents obligated me to some things culturally in my family, which I grew up expecting to do, and I did. I take exception to the idea that what we morally obligated ourselves to do in this state, in a contract, um, separate from the fact that it was a better deal for one side than the other, is still the agreement. And unless you can get both parties to agree to change it, I 
morally, ethically feel like we can't. I am responsible for what others have committed us to in the past. And the idea that we would just walk away or say no. And I'm not even sure it's legal contractually. I think it's going to the courts and previously, the court said no, we had to stay. Am I correct in that assumption? More or less, less than that. But anyway, for me, so I need you, Mr. Fruitsko, who was the one that said that you're not responsible for the promises your father made uh, um, on your behalf. No, I said I can't keep them. No, no, <laughs> it's not a can't, it's a won't. And, and, I, and I'll nail you on that, because it's a choice we make on how we live today, on how we want to take care of ourselves or others in the future. And if we ch and I, and I and we can debate this over coffee or beer, but um, we are morally responsible because we agreed to it. Well, you know, that, I think there is a certain amount of morality to it, but you also have to keep in mind that you know things do change. There's been a lot of people who were hired into a job with an expectation that they would have that job forever. The company goes under, they lose that job. I know people on my street who have lost their houses. They made a 30-year commitment to pay that mortgage on their house. They walked away. Two people killed themselves to get out of it. Those are promises that you can't keep sometimes. And sometimes you have to recognize the fact that you have put yourself into a completely unsustainable position. And that sometimes you have to say, look, you know, what, we, what are we going to do? Are we going to, you know, you know are you going to swat the mosquitoes or are you going to let the blood drain? Or are you going to renegotiate? I can see renegotiating, but I cannot see us as a society deciding to change well, the contract. Right. Okay. Well, and let, let me just get a little bit in there, because the, the question is, is it truly unsustainable, or are we simply making it unsustainable by saying, here are the other choices we made, now you're stuck? And I think that's closer to the truth here. This is a difficult problem, it's a big problem. But let's remember, we're talking about a 13 billion or eight and a half billion debt right now, if we think about it, Anyone know what the, the, the biennial budget of this state is? All funds, it's about 60 billion over two years. This is big, but in the context of the size of the budget of this state, it's not that big. And like Eric, I, you know, I am a baby born tail end, but I'm tier two, and I expect to be the oldest working trial lawyer in America, given what it's gonna to take to build up my purse. <laughs> Kathy wanted to point out she's not a purse recipient. Okay, thank you, that was a great program, gentlemen. Mr. Abrams, Mr. Abrams. <laughs> But we have one bit of business left, one bit of business. Fill out these little things. The board wants direction, and basically our last meeting is next week. We're going to do our bylaws. We're going to gather this information. We're going to find out. The pepper mill is, a, is um, in the lower between um, 185th and 170th on Kinnaman, and it's, it's down the street from a Lowell High School. Um, Spaghetti Factory will remain on the um, possible list for, for, for locations because it does have the capacity for a larger um, audience. And of course, during the political season, and several times we fill it up with standing room only. And this is a very good turnout, perhaps, because Mr. Fruits and Mr. Abrams' reputation and the subject of purse generally. But we were on a TV show. We're 30 seconds from the end. Again, I'm John Tyner, president of the forum, for one more week. Fill out these cards, hand them in. The board wants direction. We crave direction. Everyone show up next week, because we have got to get our um, officers appointed. We need a quorum, and we also need to get the new body.